Yeah, I think it's about that time we looked at another Persona game. We're going backwards in a series for once. Last year I talked extensively about Persona 5 and how wonderful it is claiming it as my favorite game of all time, as you can probably tell. And I loved it so much that almost immediately after I reviewed it, I went ahead and got Persona 4. Back then, this was the be-all and end-all for Persona games. There was nothing else like it, and it couldn't be topped. Ever since its first appearance in 2008 for the PlayStation 2, this was on many lists for some of the greatest RPGs of all time, and was a great introduction for anybody new to the series, creating an abundance of fresh fans. And yeah, I'd agree. I was a little worried that since Persona 4 was an older game, I wouldn't be sucked in as much as I was with Persona 5, but it didn't take long for me to get used to the different feel, and Persona 4 has plenty of merits to make it worth its reputation. However, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, whenever anyone talks about Persona 4, they're not immediately referring to the PS2 original. They'll be talking about Persona 4 Golden, a 2012 re-release of the game with brand new features such as more Personas, added dialogue, different voice actors for Chie and Teddy, a new character to the story named Marie who assists you in the Velvet Room, an additional chapter exclusive to Golden with its own optional dungeon, and a bunch of minor stuff that would take up an entire video to go through. This is what many consider to be the definitive version of Persona 4, and it was also the first time Persona left the Shin Megami Tensei name and became its own series. But there was one major problem. It came out for, at the time, the new PlayStation Vita. I can only assume that this was supposed to be one of the biggest selling points for the handheld, but it wasn't enough to convince a lot of gamers to buy a Vita simply for Persona 4 Golden. It's a crying shame, too, because the Vita itself isn't actually that bad, but the library of games just could not compete to the 3DS. And recently, Sony discontinued sales for the Vita, now making it even harder for people to play Play Persona 4. This game is desperate for a Switch release. We've got classic Final Fantasies on the thing, so come on Atlas, this needs to happen. Now's a good time as any to do one, given how many more fans there are after Persona 5. Physical and digital copies of Persona 4 Golden are actually really cheap for what it is, only around $20 or so, but the real major investment was for the Vita itself, which not a lot of people were willing to commit to. Some of you may also be wondering how I intend to record Vita footage since I've stated in the past that I can't record 3DS games given the more strict hardware. Well, that's where this little doohickey comes in. This is the PlayStation TV, which came out a couple of years after the Vita's launch. Simply put, it's the Vita, but you can play it on your TV if you don't like the idea of using a smaller screen. It was also advertised as a more convenient way to carry around your PS3 and PS4, but all it really does is copy the Vita, where it uses a Wi-Fi connection to turn your consoles on and run it at a lower quality with mostly an unstable frame rate and delays. An ambitious idea for its time, to say the least, but it never took off nor perfected it like the Nintendo Switch did. The other downside is only certain games are compatible with the PlayStation TV, since some Vita games like to utilize the camera and touchscreen features, so no Tearaway or Uncharted Golden Abyss. Touchscreen mechanics are perfectly doable with the DualShock Force touchpad, but there was no way around the camera, however meaningless the feature was to begin with. Luckily, Persona 4 Golden is compatible with the PlayStation TV, so if you don't want to invest in a Vita but still want to play the game, then rejoice! It's a slightly cheaper option anyway. Right, enough of the technical jargon, let's see if Persona 4 is actually worth all of that money you just spent. This is where I'll be explaining the story for the game, but like with Persona 5, I won't spoil everything that happens because part of the enjoyment is to expect the unexpected. Similar to what I did last time, I'll be making an entirely separate video with my extended thoughts on the plot, so keep a lookout for that if you're interested. Once again, you can name the protagonist however you want to, but if you want to stay canon, then his real name is Yu Narakami. Yu is transferring to the small town of Inaba for a whole year due to his parents working abroad, and will be staying with his uncle, Ryotaro Dojima, and his cousin Nanako while he's there. Almost immediately after he arrives though, it's reported that a TV announcer was found dead, with her body hanging from an antenna. The next day, Yu enters his new school and makes friends with his classmates, Chie, Yosuke, and Yukiko, as they inform him about the rumors that have spread around for something called the Midnight Channel, where if you watch your TV on a rainy night at the stroke of 12, you'll see your destined partner. They all decide to try it out to see if it works, and it sort of does, but the image is too blurry to make out who it is. To make things weirder, Yu also discovers that he can actually put himself into to the TV, which he tries to explain to Yosuke and Chie the following morning, but they of course don't believe him, until they find a bigger TV in Yosuke's dad's store and accidentally put their whole bodies in. Turns out there's an entirely new world inside every television filled with incredibly dense fog and vicious shadows made from people and their restrained emotions. The only resident the three of them find is Teddy, this bear mascot looking thing that can help the gang travel between the real world and the TV world in exchange for helping him find out who's been tossing people into the TV. It seems this is how that TV announcer from 
earlier was murdered, and as the story goes on, there could be more potential victims. At any point when there's foggy weather in the real world, the shadows in the TV world start turning aggressive, so that means if anyone's inside during that time, they'll be killed by the shadows and their bodies will be thrown back into the real world. The rumored Midnight Channel is also revealed to not be a way of showing who your love for life is, but instead who's currently in the TV world and could possibly die. With you and the others not trusting that the police would ever believe them, they decide to form the investigation team and solve this murder mystery. They come equipped for battling against shadows, including the trademark glasses made by Teddy to see past the fog, but while coming across their first group of shadows, Yu awakens to his first persona, Izanagi, to have a better chance of winning, with Yosuke and Chie obtaining their own personas from their shadows once they've accepted their true selves. The rest of the story is just making sure to rescue anyone kidnapped and put into the TV world, while also slowly piecing together who the killer could be, on top of helping the victims come to terms with their shadows and become part of the investigation team. That's the basic gist of the premise, but there's of course a lot of twists and turns and personal motives for wanting to find the killer. And there are also times in the story where the characters take a short break and go on a school trip or a night out and become closer friends. I use that term somewhat loosely though, because there is way more bickering than the Phantom Thieves ever had, mostly between Chie and Yosuke. It's amazing these two are still friends after all the rash comments and crap they put each other through. Persona 4 also has some pretty slow pacing at the start. You don't properly explore the first dungeon until three hours into the game, with very little battling beforehand, and the story in general does love to throw a lot at you. It could either be receiving new information about the killer or anything happening in the character's school lives, and it sort of feels like the game's just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks, which to be fair, it mostly does. But just take a look at how much goes on with these guys. So you've got the murder mystery plot, okay, that's fine and dandy. How about after a couple of dungeons, we'll have the kids go on an overnight school trip where they pick up trash and camp out. All right, I guess that's fine. Ah, uh, enough of that. Now we're gonna visit the Persona 3 high school and get drunk off our asses. Wait, what? Bored now, now let's have everyone form a band and take precisely two days to write a song and save Yosuke's store. I don't really see how that works, but I guess I'm open to it. Nah, scratch that. Now let's get the girls to do a beauty pageant with some bullshit rules on signing up and have the boys do a cross-dressing pageant on the exact same day. Okay, you're getting a little carried away there. Bah, that's lame. Now we're gonna spend the night at Yukiko's Inn. No, go to a festival. No, go to a fireworks display. No, no, hang out with your friends on New Year's or maybe, maybe. Oh my God, take a breath, Persona 4. Chill. On the one hand, yeah, this is the sort of thing I'd expect to see in a high school life simulator, creating a more realistic world that further fleshes out the characters. For as much as I love Persona 5, there weren't a lot of moments like these. And you could argue that something like the beach and Hawaii segments were too similar to each other, which would be fair enough. On the other hand, because of how often the activities in Persona 4 appear, it does make the story lose its focus on a few occasions. Not by much, mind you, but it is somewhat noticeable. I can see why Persona 5 didn't have a lot of activities, because Persona 4 used them all up. And don't get me wrong, these are all very entertaining and very humorous interactions, but sometimes it does feel like there's a little too much going on, especially during those times when there's such a huge gap between story and dungeons. It is a lot to take in, but in the game's defense, it does allow enough time for you to process everything. And when Persona 4 does get going with its gameplay, Atlas has made sure to put as much attention to that as well. Same as before, you'll spend half of your time doing whatever's available to you in Inaba, such as raising your social stats by various means and hanging out with your friends to raise their confidant levels, or social links as Persona 3 and 4 call it, while during the other half of the game, you're dungeon crawling in the TV world battling against a bunch of different shadows. These enemies aren't like the ones in Persona 5 though, where they were basically evil personas that you could recruit. These were designed from the ground up to be just normal enemies, so that means no negotiating this time, but I don't think it's a huge loss. Improving social links is also just as important as it was last time, as your party members will gain new abilities as the rank goes higher, but unlike Persona 5, this only applies to your team, and even then, the abilities you earn are specific to that character rather than the entire party. The only exceptions being resace abilities and the occasional follow-up attack a character contributes to after exploiting an enemy's weakness. And there's a lot of social links in Persona 4. It's actually kind of overwhelming. Even on New Game Plus, it's pretty much impossible to max out every single social link by the time you finish the story. There's a bit too many to look out for, and honestly, some of these side characters are just not that interesting. I'm not gonna act like every side character in Persona 5 was great because a few of them weren't, but I think what made most of them work was their involvement in the story, no matter how small. You don't really get anything like that in Persona 4, you just sort of meet these guys out of the blue. I feel for someone like Shu, who's constantly under pressure from trying to be perfect, and Ko, who turns out to be from a foster home and looking for his real parents, but I can't stand someone like Yumi or Ai who are just flat out horrible people. There was even a moment where I called out Ai's bitchiness towards someone asking her out, but that apparently stalls my friendship with her from growing until I make amends. I thought that was only a thing in Persona 3, but turns out I was wrong. I know that she and Yumi are supposed to learn their lessons by the 
again, but their shitty attitudes really did start to grate on me. All for some extra experience points when fusing personas of that arcana and nothing else. I'm sorry, I'm complaining far too early. Pushing away the side characters, I do really like the main cast. Kanji's a lot of fun no matter which scene he's in, and Troy Baker does a fantastic job voicing him. Yukiko's an absolute sweetheart, and her laughing fits are difficult not to smile at. Rize's got a cool design to her, and I like her bubbly demeanor as well. Plus, Laura Bailey is a great fit for her voice, despite being a little distracting that I was hearing Catherine C. Chie was okay, but her voice actress needed to dial it back a bit. Now, Toe I was a bit mad with at first, but I eventually grew to enjoy. The only ones I didn't really care for were Teddy and Yosuke. Teddy's voice really started to irritate me in a short time, and his moves on the girls were just creepy. And Yosuke ain't no Ryuji, that's for sure. In fact, he's kind of a dick to the girls most of the time. The way he talks to them can be really detestable. But you know what? Even with the weaker characters, the dialogue exchanges all flow very nicely between them. The humor is on point, and there's hardly ever a dull moment with these guys, which for a 70-hour RPG is quite impressive. Back to the gameplay side of things, just like Persona 5, the investigation team has a time limit to rescue those that have been kidnapped before the fog covers Inaba, meaning you have to keep checking the weather channels to see how long you have left. The key to battling, minus the gameplay, also again comes down to finding the enemy's weakness to knock them over, then delivering the coup de grace with an all-out attack once every enemy in the battle is on the floor. However, instead of getting the advantage in battles by sneaking like the Phantom Thieves did, this time you have to get closer to the shadow and strike their backs to get the first move. Clearing battles may also occasionally give you access to shuffle time. No, this doesn't involve dancing. Oh. Instead, these are different tarot cards that you may take only one of, but that chosen card could provide either a positive or negative effect. So, for example, there are cards that increase your money and experience points, but there are also cards that take away money and experience points in exchange for being able to grab more cards in that hand. And if all of the cards in that hand are gone, you'll earn a sweet bonus that lets you grab more cards at the start of the next shuffle time. Meaning, if you come across a good hand in that next battle, you'll be gaining more as a result. In addition, shuffle time is also the only way to earn Persona, so activate it when you can because it's pretty essential to completing Persona 4. And you can increase the chances of accessing it by hitting enemies with their weaknesses, as well as continuously doing all-out attacks. This is a brilliant risk versus reward system, and it's faster than chatting with the Personas over and over again to get what you want. I don't mind the negotiating in Persona 5 at all, but shuffle time keeps the pace going, and I like it more for that. Unfortunately, when fusing Personas, there's still no way to figure out what combinations make what without looking it up on the internet. Not a terribly big deal, but it's just as much of a nuisance fusing a persona with a very specific ability to raise the social link for Igor's new attendant Margaret as it was for the twins in Persona 5. I'm on and off with the dungeons themselves as well. They're now split into several floors, all randomly generated with different paths to take and treasure chests to find, with the goal in each one being to find the stairs and go to the next floor. Basically, just imagine mementos if that was all the dungeon crawling was. Not every single floor is like this, but it's an interesting way to increase replayability. The downside, however, is that if you're like me and want to clear the dungeon as quickly as possible so that you can spend more time racing your social links, it can get tedious after a while. The backgrounds change with each dungeon, but you're still doing the same thing over and over again. And rarely does the dungeon throw a curveball at you, though even then it's usually just backtracking to a previous floor to collect something. The battles themselves are just as fun as before, but the dungeon layouts are kind of bland overall, only being saved by the cool looking aesthetics and the music. I much preferred how Persona 5 did it by properly constructing the dungeons and keeping the randomly generated rated stuff to mementos, which as you may remember, I said was the weakest part of that game. Backup party members don't level up along with your four chosen characters either, so unless you don't care about a certain one, that means you'll have to keep rearranging your party to make sure they don't fall behind. These rare hand enemies can help alleviate that time by gaining tons of experience points after killing them, but their evasion rate is so high that half the time you'll miss your attacks, and if you don't kill them quickly, then there's a chance that they'll flee from the battle, which sucks so damn hard after spending so much SP. Sadly, you also still get a game over if the protagonist dies. But this is where I actually think Persona 4 does a better job handling this than 5. If you died in Persona 5, you had to start from the last save room, and that could be infuriating in places like the second to last palace where they were so far between. Persona 4, however, simply puts you back at the start of the floor, which is still kind of a pain, but I find this to be much less punishing and rage-inducing, since most floors aren't especially big. I'll take that over how Persona 3 handles death penalties. Ugh, we'll talk about that game another day. 
Actually, speaking of Persona 3, it's a little annoying how the default tactic for each new party member is to be controlled by the AI like in that game, so you have to fiddle around in the menus until you have complete control over that character. Not a major issue in the grand scheme of things, but it was just a pet peeve I had. I also don't see what the point of this networking service was inside the dungeons. I guess other players will help you in the brink of battle, but I never felt the need to use it. It was more useful to me outside of the dungeons because it was the only way I could see who was available to socialize with on that day without having to wander around every Everywhere. Contrast to Persona 5, where you could just check each location on the map and see who's willing to hang out, and even lets you know if their confidant's ready to level up. By the way, get Risei social link to rank 10 ASAP, because her abilities rock. Futaba's a great character in Persona 5, but Risei is a much more practical navigator. On top of the occasional stat buffs to your party, shielding them from a painful attack, and sometimes increasing the damage for an all-out attack, she'll eventually restore HP and SP after each battle, as well as very late in the game when she'll do a full enemy analysis to save experience experimenting for weaknesses, and oh, she can revive the protagonist if he dies. But that just begs the question, why the hell wasn't this in Persona 5 as well? That could have saved me actually having to find a flaw with that game. Risei's also the one I chose to romance with for my first two playthroughs, though it was a very tough decision between her and Yukiko. However, during my second playthrough, Risei's jealousy towards other girls did start to raise some red flags for me, and she could just be a little too clingy for my liking. So I think next time I'll stick with Yukiko. I'll take Makoto from Persona 5 over either of these two girls, but as for Persona 4, yeah, Yukiko's best girl. Okay, returning to one paragraph ago, you may have networking features to save you going back and forth around Inaba, but that doesn't mean it still won't be required for story purposes. About half of the dungeons in Persona 4 ask that you search everywhere you can possibly go and talk to every single NPC until you get a clue about what the victim was like, because for some reason that'll help Teddy and Rize find them. It's most likely as well that the right person to talk to isn't around on that particular day, and since you can't socialize with your party members until you figure out where to go, it's almost a complete waste of the day. These are easily the worst parts of the game, and I never look forward to them. I really don't understand why these needed to exist and how Atlas could possibly think they were fine. They don't take very long to do, all things considered, but it feels like so much longer. It kills all momentum the game had going for it, and it isn't necessary in the slightest. Okay, I realize that I've been complaining a lot about Persona 4, and I'm constantly comparing it to Persona 5, so you probably don't think I'm a very big fan of this game, but that couldn't be any farther from the truth. Persona 4 is a fantastic game, and worthy of being referred to as one of the greatest RPGs ever made. Some of the issues I mentioned are pretty minor anyway, and I'm not saying that Persona 5 is problem-free, because it isn't, as much as it pains me to say it. Then Persona 4 comes very close to meeting those same standards, but 5 just did that little bit more for me. Don't let my words tarnish Persona 4 as a game overall, because the amount of things it does right completely overshadows the problems I had with it. The spin on traditional RPG mechanics are still present here and are just as unique. There's still a fair amount of style to the game. Again, not as much as Persona Persona 5, but we are talking about more limited hardware here. And the same goes for the graphics. They're a little more muddy and basic, but they somehow still have some charm to them, and once again, the anime cutscenes are enjoyable to watch, with a very heartwarming ending that got me close to shedding a tear, just like Persona 5. Musically, it's a bit different to Persona 5, mixing rock and J-pop as opposed to a more jazzy feel like last time, but all of them are pretty damn catchy. I can't recall a single track that I didn't like. Love this opening theme music, man. It's called Shadow World, and it took a while for it to really sink in, but now now I can't get it out of my head. The boss music in the extra dungeon is also fantastic. In fact, I love that boss fight in general, one of my favorites in the series. I won't show what happens, and admittedly, the dungeon holding it is rather annoying, but if you can persevere, I guarantee it'll be worth it. I am aware as well that you can fight Margaret during New Game Plus, but frustratingly, I didn't meet all the requirements before the end of a very strict time limit, meaning I have to go through the game for a third time. One day I'll do it, but now's not that time. Oh well, at least I can now say I've defeated the Wardens from Persona 5, and the Reaper, as a a matter of fact, so maybe next year I'll face Margaret. In the meantime, I can watch the Persona 4 anime series, which I can say without a single doubt is better than Persona 5's. This is a great anime. It keeps to the spirit of the game, the animation's clean and crisp, and the comedy and drama is well done throughout every episode. You can tell Atlas wanted to milk the Persona 4 property for all it's worth, too. They knew how popular it was. There were not one, but two fighting games made by the Blaze Blue crew. Then the year after that, there was Persona Q, Shadow of the Labyrinth, which was a crossover title between Persona 3 and 4 characters, as well as gameplay borrowed from Metrian Odyssey, and there's even a sequel coming out very soon, starring the Persona 5 cast alongside 3 and 4s. Finally, in 2015, there was Dancing All Night, a rhythm game that nobody asked for but still managed to be surprisingly entertaining.
beginning. I do own most of these games, so I'll definitely dedicate a review to each of them maybe after I talk about Persona 3. Persona 4 was held in a lot of people's hearts and for a very good reason. If Persona 5 was the flame that made the series hot right now, Persona 4 was the spark that started it. I can't really say go try out this game if Persona 5 didn't already convince you, and as I said at the start of this video, it's a lot harder to invest in financially, but if perchance you still have a Vita, a PlayStation TV, or just curious after loving the hell out of Persona 5, then do what you can to play Persona 4. I'm hoping that Persona 3 won't take me as long to talk about, but considering how I'm covering both the original PS2 version and Persona 3 Portable for the PSP, yeah, I think that's going to take me a while, because there are some major differences between them. In the meantime, I'm going to take this outfit off and go back to Devil May Cry as we discuss the beloved third game in the series that's also the last one to be seen on the PlayStation 2. Hope to see you then, and take care. Some of you may also... Some of you may also be wondering, damn it, sorry, I get really hot in this thing. <laughs> but that couldn't be any farther from the truth. Persona 5, not Persona 5, well, Persona 5 is a fantastic game, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs>